live from the mist and shrouded mountaintop fortress that is X and Y Communications Headquarters. You're listening to the world famous Mountaintop Podcast. And now, here's your host, Scott McKay. All right, here we are once again with another episode of the world famous Mountaintop Podcast. My name is Scott McKay at Scott McKay on Twitter, real Scott McKay on Instagram. You can find us on the web at www.mountaintoppodcast.com. You can find us on YouTube under Scott McKay. And I always, always invite you guys to join our amazing group of guys seeking to be better men on the Facebook group at the Mountaintop Summit. With me today is a new friend of mine. She's actually funny and cool. Right? Go figure. Yeah, this is going to be a lot of fun. Her name is Jennifer Doherty, and she's a comedian, a performance artist, a Second City alum. How about that? So uh, no pressure there, Jennifer. And she's also a health coach. She's the author of a book with a fantastic premise behind it called How to Bounce Back When Your Dreams Have Not Worked Out, Have Burned You Out, or Have Died. And this particular episode is coming on the heels of of an episode with Michael Lawson last time where we talked about something pretty deep and amazing. And let me tell you something, guys, that show got so many downloads. So I'm excited to see where this one goes. I have no idea what twists and turns we're going to take, but without anything further, I definitely want to introduce you to our guest, Jennifer Doherty. Jennifer, welcome. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Well, you should be because this is really (laughs) a cool show and you wouldn't believe how amazing our audience is. I'm so excited. You have no idea. I, I really love the the topic than the angles you have slated for today. Yeah, well, it's yours. So I hope you love it. How to bounce <laughs> back when your dreams have not worked out, have burned you out or have died. So I have to ask this. I hope this isn't too painful a question for a professional comedian. Although, you know, out of our pain can come some pretty damn funny stuff. Yes. What led you to write this particular book? So I was in a corporate job. I was in the corporate world for 10 years and uh, I got severely burnt out myself. And I was constantly, when you're a performer, you have your day job and then you have your performance world, then you have your life. And so all of it was kind of just culminating into this chronic burnout season. And when I was going through coaching school, I was learning really tangible strategies to overcome burnout and how to still have the life you want. And sometimes we get a little scared, like uh, we want our dreams, but we feel like they're not monetized yet or they're not paying us enough yet. So we feel like we can't have them. And, And that does something to our psyche and to our health, because when we don't pursue the things we love, we start to we're more, more prone to loneliness, depression, and all those other negative, darker emotions. So I really think that burnout is a relevant topic to a lot of different people in a lot of industries. And there are some resources that you can do to help overcome it. And that's what that book really um, helps people dive into. The first interesting thing I caught from what you just described is how even if we're doing something we love, you know, we're living the dream as it were, we can still burn out from it and end up feeling either depressed or just sick and tired. Okay. So everything isn't always wine and roses just because we're doing something we're passionate about, right? Oh, yes. I actually have more clients that say they got burnt out after getting their dream than in the pursuit of the dream, which is totally ironic to me. And and there is a part of the book where I touch on that because it's something you don't think about. It's something that sneaks up on us. We're living our life. We're go, go, go. We're doing all the things. We're achieving that corporate ladder or whatever that career looks like for us. And then one day we kind of wake up and be like, wow, I really still don't like my life. Well, you know, it's interesting because that's played out a little bit in my own life. I mean, back in 2005, when we started X and Y communications, being a dating coach was the coolest thing in the world. It still is by the way, but I had this amazing ability. I don't guess it's so amazing if you're passionate about it. It's almost like an addiction (laughs) to immerse myself constantly in what I was quote unquote working at because it didn't feel like work at all. I love doing it. I love working with these guys. I love talking to these guys. I love thinking about how to make our relationships better, how to get better at meeting women and flirting with them and turning them on and all that stuff. It was just way too much fun. And sometimes I was going to work the next morning, two days later, because I hadn't slept yet. And that was what was going on. And my wife, Emily was starting to get concerned with me because 
I was doing this superhuman thing here, staying awake. It was almost like quite literally my job was like being on crystal meth. I was addicted to it and it was like giving me these crazy superpowers to stay awake and, you know, probably making more of it than it actually was. But she sat me down and said, Hey, you know what I want you to do? I want you to get on Netflix with me and watch something that is absolutely brain dead for a half hour. And I was like, but, but, but I got stuff to do. And you know what? That changed my life. Taking a half an hour to an hour a day of doing something brain dead. And then from there, once I cut off from that immediate addictive nature to the work I was doing, you know, I don't know what else to say. I'm not really a, an addictive personality, but for some reason I was so immersed in what I did that it felt like that. And next thing you know, I was able to go to the gym, get eight hours of sleep at night, get on a much better schedule. And what do you know? I was a lot more productive, Jennifer. Is that something you've seen as a pattern? Am I onto something? Yes. And if people don't take that time, some people call it stillness. Some people call it unplugging. For some people, it looks like meditation. I actually had a boss in the corporate world that after a stressful meeting with the executives, she had four coloring crayons and a little mini coloring book that she colored while she was on the phone with somebody to decompress from all the crossfire from the executive team that had happened. So there's little tiny ways you can have strategies. But if you don't recognize that you are heading towards burnout or you are in burnout, what can happen is it can manifest into a health crisis and it can manifest into these other things that your wife did you a wonderful gift. It might not have felt like it at the time. You might have felt like, oh, I have to slow down. And it might have been a little bit awkward or painful for you. But if you would have had on the track where you just kept going, 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 eventually your body would have told you it's enough and you would have had to stop. And so that's the catch 22 of burnout is our society puts a lot of stuff on our plates. Like we have relationships to maintain, we have financial challenges, we have all of these different things. And, you know, our bodies will say it's enough. And when it's enough, you'll have to unplug. Like there's a lot of issues with burnout with adrenal fatigue. When you get adrenal fatigue, your body biochemically stops functioning properly. And a lot of people don't even realize that that's a thing. And when you do, when your body does get to that level of burnout, you're at a position where you have to start having better boundaries and better care for yourself and better foods in your diet. Otherwise, that's going to manifest in a whole lot of other things. Well, how many times have we heard about someone who was who was living the dream by our standards and ostensibly theirs as well, doing what they love, and then they kill over from a heart attack at 45, right? Yes. Yes. I've actually, like, I think Jim Carrey states it really well that I wish everybody could become famous and rich so you could see that that's not the solution. And I think that that's such um, a beautiful thing because he spent so much time building his career and like getting the bigger jobs and, and really being a voice in Hollywood. And it really sort of rings true to me. Like what makes me say that is the wording that you used of we look at someone else's life and by our standards, we feel like they're a success. But to them, that person, they might feel that they're chronically behind because we all have sort of this illusion that other people's success is more than us. And therefore we're, we're like not having enough and we're sort of robbing ourselves. And it's sort of a form of self hate in a way because you aren't allowing yourself to be fully present in the moment. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And of course, everybody compares themselves and their own success and the quality of their dream or their passions as it were to someone else. And that never ends well. I mean, I'm reminded once again, of how LeBron James felt, quote unquote, disrespected because he wasn't put on the Mount Rushmore of NBA players all time. I mean, there can only be four on Mount Rushmore, right? So he's disrespected. Come on, right? Right. Well, there's billionaires that lose, you know, 500 million in the stock market and they feel that they're not wealthy and they're going to end up broke. And it's like, you just lost 5 million. You still have 5 billion more. I know, but poor babies. To- <laughs> My heart goes out to all of them. But it's the point of your own perception. It's the point of, oh, like I'm no longer the success that I was, or I feel behind, or I don't have enough of this. And so we we rob ourselves of having that joy that we could totally have if we just allowed ourselves to receive it. Well, you know, Jennifer, we're throwing a lot of cold water here on a lot of very warm dreams that people have, which makes me think it can only bring up the question 
are dreams overrated or are they underrepresented in terms of how great they're going to be when you ever reach them? Because all we're told growing up is you can be anything you want. Never, ever give up on your dreams. And we sound like the freaking good witch in the Wizard of Oz. I mean, is it valid to teach our kids that? I mean, we don't want to rain on their parade at an early age and go, now nah, forget it. You'll never be president. You're not tall enough. You know, what do we do? How do we yeah. handle that before the dreams become reality? What is a reasonable way to frame our dreams, our kids' dreams, everybody else's dreams? I'd love to hear your take on that. So I am of the opinion that without a dream, your soul's kind of dying because you have nothing to work for. You have nothing, you know, you don't have a stronger purpose. And when you're living for a purposeful goal or dream, you take action in a completely different way than if you didn't have that. So I wouldn't say that. The absence of dreams is bad or good because actually it could be problematic to not have a dream at all. Um, but the problem comes into when we get so fixated that the dream that we desire is the only dream that we want and nothing else could come to fruition for us. And that is where when we teach our kids that they can have a dream, one of the best things we could teach them is, yes, you can be anything you want. What do you think is the actions you need to get there? And are you willing to do those actions? Because it's one thing to teach our kids and say, oh, just have a dream and go after it. But the reality is you don't really get that dream unless you're taking the actions to it. And sometimes we want the dream, but we don't want those actions. So if a child is saying, oh, I want to be an NFL player okay, what are the actions that you would have to take to be an NFL player? What does this commitment look like? And sometimes over time, the kid's like, actually, it sounded cool. It sounded glamorous, but actually, I don't want to do all that. <laughs> that sounds like a lot of work. Maybe I want to um, hang out with my friends and go do robotics classes because I like hanging out with my friends. I like being creative and I like creating machinery. Well, then, then that joy of doing that activity lends itself to a dream of being a developer or a programmer or different things. So we don't have to just fixate on the more glamorous dreams. We can allow ourselves to say, what is it that we really want to do? How is it that we really want to be? And what are the actions to get there? And I think that is when we can back up and say, you can be anything that you want because you're doing it. You're, you're taking the actions. And then if you fail, we have such a we have such a culture that if you fail, you're not a success. It's like an automatic, you failed, you're done. And that's not actually the case because oftentimes to become the biggest successes in the world, you have to have a lot of failure because it means you're putting yourself out there and you're taking those actions. So I think it's sort of a sort of an in-between that we have to have the dream, but we also have to set up the expectation of what does it take to get that dream? Yeah, 100 percent. And I would add to that that a lot of times, especially when we're young, we dream of something without actually realizing the fullness of what that dream actually entails. Like, yes. I'll need both hands to count how many young guys I've talked to who dream of being a Navy SEAL. And I'll say, OK, cool. Uh, wait until it's 50 degrees outside. Get in your skivvies and go swim in the ocean for five miles. And they're like, oh, God, you got to be kidding. Oh, well, maybe you don't want to be a Navy SEAL after all. Yes. <laughs> you know, that's just a that's just. An example, or like, I would love to be a fighter pilot. Well, I'm hoping you're good at math and engineering. Well, I can't stand either. Well, you know, flying's cool, but maybe the preparation isn't for you. And it's not that you're trying to stomp on someone's dreams like they're grapes, <laughs> although you could get pretty good wine if you do that, right? But <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't be all bad to stomp on someone's dreams. And make but I love it. Lucy's skit of her like stomping out grapes just came to mind when you said that. So. Yeah, that's probably, <laughs> probably an unfair analogy in this context. But anyway, I think it's fair to give our kids or maybe even give each other or anybody we're tasked with being a mentor to. Obviously, it won't be necessarily unsolicited advice. Nobody wants that. But I think when we do dream something, let's make it first person. When we do dream something, we owe it to ourselves to be responsible enough to figure out what it is we're really dreaming about. Because I'll tell you something right now. If you're dreaming of being a dating coach, for example, you're in for a lot of writing, a lot of computer time. OK, <laughs> <laughs> that's just the truth. OK, so it isn't all, you know, this incredible, glamorous thing. I'm reminded also of a conversation that I had just recently about the nature of dreams and how we accomplish them or not. 
And I would love to hear your take on the relationship between talent, passion, and hard work. Because mm -hmm. someone was saying, hey, you know what? If you work hard enough at something, you'll accomplish your dreams. And I'm like, yeah, most people have some inherent talent for it and they actually love doing it. Then they still have to work hard to get where they want to be. So I don't know. That sounds a little Pollyanna-ish to me. What do you think? Well, I definitely have to say when we have the perception that it takes hard work to get something, um, we set ourselves up where that's what our experience will always be. It will always be hard to achieve that. And that sounds a little uh, abstract, but it's it's kind of the premise of if you believe that everything takes hard work to get somewhere, you're going to find yourself in employment situations or monetary generation standpoints where it takes a ridiculous amount of hard work to be paid. You might be well paid, but you're constantly having to work hard. But I do believe that if you shift that and you say a strong work ethic is required, this is true. And where I think the intersection between passion, talent, and hard work is if you're doing work in the zones of your genius, then when you add hard work, it goes so much faster and you get results faster. And the passion is what energetically fuels you to get you out of bed and go do it rather than be lackadaisical about your day. But there is a component where talent is sort of necessary, but it can be honed. Um, I think of someone who wants to sing. If someone that wants to sing has a good voice, then they can enhance it by, you know, by doing conditioning and voice lessons, going to auditions, putting themselves out there. But what's going to get them a job with singing or to have a brand of singing is going to be the other components, passion, strategy, hard work. And so it's not just one thing. It's sort of like it's a chair. And if you take one of those things away, the chair is going to topple over because it's on one, two or three legs. But if you have all four components then that's when you have more stability and it can really move you forward. So there's definitely unique kind of components of all of them. I mean, if you ask somebody else, they would say hard work is everything. But if hard work was everything, then a lot of people would have their dreams by now. And a lot of people wouldn't necessarily be burned out. I think it's wonderful you added that fourth leg of the proverbial chair called strategy. If you don't have a yes. plan, you can't really expect anything to work out. You know, you can have all the talent, exactly. passion, and work as hard as a hamster running around in its wheel forever and ever, and you still won't get anywhere. Love it. Yes. Yeah. I also love that you throw on the table this idea of people and their beliefs tending to manifest themselves as reality. In other words, if I believe I have to work hard in order to succeed at anything, then I'm going to, in fact, feel guilty when I achieve something without the proverbial hard work having exactly. been done. And then that'll be a self-fulfilling prophecy and I'll fail at it. First thing that comes to mind, God help me, I'm a dating and relationship coach. People have been told ad nauseum, it is just blindly handed down advice that relationships are hard work. Man, my wife and I haven't experienced hard work in holding our relationship together since day one because we get each other, because we're optimistic and generous to each other. Everything that happens we're much better off being in it together than apart. And one plus one equals three or 10 or 100 because we're in it together. <laughs> it just is not hard work to love this woman. It would be harder work at every level if she wasn't side by side with me in this life. Yes. And yet I'm a voice crying out in the wilderness. Every relationship coach in the world will roll their eyes at what I just said, but it doesn't change the fact that it's our reality. And if you can position yourself vis-a-vis -vis your dreams, who you're dreaming of, your vision, your strategy, right? I mean, you know, maybe your talents and ability to be relational with someone else does enter into it. But if you make good decisions up front, then you don't have to deal with the bad decisions and the disastrous results of those later. Yes. And that's, I think, where it becomes sort of an opinionated danger zone because um, like it's, for instance, if a dating coach is focusing on just helping singles get dates, well, there's some, there's, I stopped subscribing to a lot of them during my single years because I got I tired of, <laughs> I got tired of hearing, oh, you need to fix this about you and this and fix and fix and fix. And if you are an authentically trained health and life coach, you know that at the 
foundational level of neuroscience and proper habit change is we are imperfectly perfect as we are, meaning that we don't have to change and fix a bunch of stuff. What we have to do is we have to fix our beliefs and how our habits. And then when we fix that, not us, but those habits, we get to have the life that we actually desire. And sometimes the actual life that we desire, we don't know we desire it until it happens because it wasn't even in our awareness. You hear of all the times of couples that the ones that really mesh well together, they were never going to be the ones that they found on a profile. On a dating profile, they would have passed them because they didn't they didn't have this and this and this and this of their checklist. But together when they met them, it was like, "Wow, you actually you actually are the person for me because you get me in this kind of way. And it brings up the question. I've always kind of wondered in the back of my mind when, you know, because when you're a coach, people tell you the places that they're struggling and, and, and relationships and marriage is definitely one of them. And it doesn't matter if they have a really beautiful relationship and they've been married 18 years or one. There is something that bugs them about their significant other. And one of the things that has crossed my mind is are the people that are super miserable in relationships do they get married for the wrong reasons? And if they did, they have to kind of look within themselves why they want to be with each other, not just divorce right away, but really kind of get to know the new them because we evolve and we change. And sometimes I think that just needs a little bit more bringing together and you realize, wow, this spouse, when they do this thing, sure, it annoys me, but I do X, Y, Z thing that annoys them, but we are really great together. And when you kind of approach it with that foundational level, level, you get to have a much more joyful life. Well, I mean, some people get married because the woman wants a fairy tale wedding and pressured the poor bastard into marrying her. And that's it. I know. I I definitely don't agree with that as a woman. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, there are a million and one bad reasons to get married. And yet everyone who has good, solid intentions to have a wonderful relationship and build a legacy and live, quote unquote, happily ever after everybody's collectively looking at all the divorce statistics and going, oh, hell no. And then they're looking at what happens in divorce court and how the lawyers end up with all the money and go, oh, double hell no. And Mm -hmm. the sad part about that, Jennifer, is if we just would simply make, I mean, simple, but not easy, I guess, right? Because everybody falls into this trap, it seems, or 50% of us fall into this trap, it seems. If we would just make good decisions and get married to the right person, Everything would be fine. This morning I was reading on the medium, which of course is a repository for people being miserable <laughs> and wanting people to give them a standing ovation for it. <laughs> My kind of website for sure. This lady was saying, yeah, I knew when we were standing at the altar together that we should never get married and he was probably going to be abuser. And I was right. And I'm like, and you're saying this out loud and you're proud of it. <laughs> Why in the world would you get married when you know you're not supposed to? And then a little trigger went off in my mind and went, you idiot. That's exactly how you felt standing at the altar when you were 28 years old, getting married to the wrong woman. And so, you know, I don't know what goes through our minds when we're making all these horrible decisions, but man, people make terrible decisions and they know they're giving up their dreams in favor of something convenient or something that makes them feel better in the moment. I'm sure deep down everyone who's ever got addicted to heroin or crystal meth. That's two crystal meth references in one episode. Go figure. (laughs) I bet deep down, I know this is really a dark thing to say, but deep down, I bet they knew they were ruining their life and giving up their dreams right then. And yet people still do it. I think as a society, we are taught to think with our brain and not honor our intuition. And so that woman who's voicing that on that blog post What she is actually saying is my gut wisdom was right, but I didn't have the courage to honor it. That's the story I would tell my former self when I was 28. I would say, don't do that because of exactly the reasons you just cited. Mm -hmm. Crystal clear to me now. Yes. I think when the, the more we age as we get older and the more life experiences we have, when we reflect back, we hopefully start to learn that intuition was always right. Man, if I could just take all the relationship skills I have now <laughs> and all the wisdom I have and pour it into my 15-year-old self, I would have been the freaking Mac Daddy, you know? <laughs> wow. I think when it comes to having abundance in life, in any area of our life, I think if we haven't been listening to our intuition, our gut wisdom, 
very often, it's hard to hear it. And that is where being still or meditation or in a a activity that doesn't involve a lot of brain power is an activity that's really good because it helps us kind of tap into that internal voice within ourselves. There was a situation that I had that I dated someone for seven years and I realized he wasn't my husband because he started to, he started to take on some habits and behaviors that were not what I wanted in a husband in terms of like, he would get angry over certain things and he didn't want to take feedback. And it just got to the point where I was like, I can't wake up next to this person every single day. And really that was a gut wisdom decision. And I remember I told family and friends, I'm breaking up with so-and-so. And and I felt really empowered because I made this decision. And everyone kept telling me, are you sure that might be the greatest mistake of your life? You've been together seven years. That's in more than American marriages. Are you sure you're not giving up the love of your life? And I had to stand there and be very bold and say, I don't understand it, but my gut says I shouldn't marry him. And let me tell you something, I've never regretted that to this day. Well, I'll tell you You mentioned maturity and growing older, which is inevitable, unless the far less preferable alternative kicks in, right? (laughs) But growing old and getting more mature gives you that life wisdom that makes your gut feelings more reliable and more trustworthy, doesn't it? I think it's where we start to really accept that our gut wisdom, even though it may not make sense, is the thing that's always in our corner. It's always like rooting us on. Our brains tend to, we call it critter brain in coaching school. Our brains tend to tell us when we go to make a decision and we're going to take action, we, after a while, right away or days later, come up with all the reasons why we're not good enough. Why that situation that happened 10 years ago that proved we weren't smart. How can we do this thing now? And we sort of like, our brains will sometimes beat us up because they're trying to protect us. But our internal gut wisdom is always there for us. It's the thing that's in our back corner, no matter what we're going through. And I think as a society, if we're not in tune with that wisdom, it tells us when we're burnt out. It tells us when we're heading to that burnout phase, if someone else isn't coming into our lives and letting us know. And I think that's something that in our American society and and the world at large, we aren't taught to really honor that voice. Indeed. So what would you tell the guy who's listening to this particular episode and thinking, you know, my dreams just aren't working out or they're taking too long or I'm starting to lose faith that I can accomplish them? How do you reconcile that mindset? And what do you do if you have to come to the hard conclusion that your dream isn't working out? Yeah, that that is where the loss of a dream not working out, like seriously not working out. You've tried all avenues. It is a definite no. That is sort of a loss that is something to be grieved a bit, especially if you've held that dream and that North Star in your mind for a very long time. That can be a process to either let that go. But there is definitely a point when you bounce back from dream death and you really get clear on why you want to bounce back and you've grieved the process, you open yourself up to a new beginning where either a new dream will cross your path or you'll find an avenue to that old dream. It just looks nothing like what you expected. And I think sometimes we get so caught up and it has to happen fast because if it happens fast, then I get X, Y, Z, and then I get this, and then I get that, and then I'll be happy. But I think the key is, is when you're going through a process like this, is you ask yourself, how can I be happy today? with where my life's at just today. And for some, for some dream deaths, the happiness is I had a coffee in my Keurig today. And that might just be the simplest thing. And then you build upon that muscle because it's really the internal wisdom is, is always got your back and it can lend itself to helping you find a revival of that dream or a new dream that you just love deliciously more. You know, we as men especially are told never, ever, ever give up. You know, we can hear Winston Churchill echoing in our psyche. (laughs) (laughs) But there's a big difference between not quitting and being stubborn, isn't there? I think that there's, and this is the best way that I can describe it. I think there's a difference of honoring your persistent nature and honoring what life is trying to shape in you. I think for a long time, I fought 
doing comedy. Like I've just said, I can't make money at it. I'll never make money at writing and I'll never do this and I'll never do that. And life kept throwing me situations until I finally could accept, oh, this is the path I'm supposed to be on. And so sometimes in our lack of ability to give up, life is just going to keep throwing us that stuff until we wake up and say, oh, wait, there is a better fit path for me. And for some people, it's not going to be comedy. It could be a multi of different things. But you sort of have this awakening of, oh, there is a different path. And if I would just honor that, I could have a life of bliss. <laughs> sure, I'll still have problems, but I'll feel like I'm in a life of bliss because I'm I'm in the pursuit of the dream or I get to be in the dream without burnout. It's sort of an abstract way to think about it, but I think it really hones true. Yeah, I think that's excellent what you just said. I'm also reminded of the old talking head song where he goes, this is not my beautiful house. This is not my beautiful wife. I think a lot of times people get what they asked for in terms of what they thought their dreams were going to be. Then they arrive and either, like you said, it's as if they're a dog who's finally caught the car they were chasing. Now that I'm here, I don't have anything driving me anymore and it just feels boring or kind of anticlimactic or they go, you know, this isn't what I bargained for. This isn't what I wanted. What do you tell someone like that? Just go back to the drawing board, find a new dream, snap yourself out of this perhaps comfort level that you've gotten yourself into because, you know, maybe life isn't so hard. Maybe you got what you wanted and it's okay. It just doesn't feel like a dream anymore. How do you know when you've fallen into that trap of just being really, really deep in your comfort zone? And man, if you ever had to go in the quote unquote real world again, you'd get a rude awakening versus, you know what? It is time for me to call this one of my life purposes or dreams in life solved, finished. My work is done here and know that it's time to stop being stubborn, like I said before, and go do something else or else you'll die there. I mean, how do you... How do you know when it's time to do something else? I think that is when, you know, just like the woman who knew that she shouldn't marry the man because he might be abusive. She kind of had an inkling of that. And I think when you're processing dream, death, burnout, all of those things, and you're deciding, should I continue on the path I'm on or should I take a new path? I think at that point, it's a good opportunity to take inventory of all the things that have come at you that you can remember and write them down and sort of process, is there a theme? Is there a theme to what I'm getting back in life? And to also touch back on the aspect of going back into the real world, what I have problems. I think if you've been so in the groove of your everyday life that it's been a while since you've taken some risks, it's time to like, take some risks and stretch your comfort zone for someone that's single and they haven't been on a date in a year, but they want to have better quality relationships. It might mean I'm going to take a risk and I'm going to go do a new activity to make some new great friends, or I'm going to go take a risk and I'm going to go ask this girl out and I'm going to put myself back out there for someone that's married. It might be, wow, my life has become very regimented, very routine, very redundant. What is something that I can bring some aliveness in? A lot of men suffer when we don't, we don't really like to talk about this as a society, but men become very isolated and can become perhaps lonely as we age because women, we like to hang out with our girlfriends, but guys aren't always as quick to go hang out with their guy friends. And so if your life is becoming monotonous, it's time to, you know, take that risk, go call that buddy from a year or two ago, ask them, let's go hang out, let's go do something. Or maybe it's, try a new activity or a new class to, to you get some creativity back in your life. Those would be the steps I would take. And they sound so simple, but really it can be so simple to shift and to start feeling like that joy that you're on the path that you're supposed to be on and really heal burnout if that's been an issue. Yeah. You know, when you've completed what you told yourself your dreams were, it can feel very comfortable indeed. And then that gives birth to laziness. Yes. You kind of have this little pang that you want to do something else. And then you say to yourself, oh, come on, you're living the dream. This is literally what you dreamed of and you're living it. That's called living the dream, bud. Calm down. Stop being (laughs) such a flake. Other people would kill to have what you have. Get on with it. And that kind of notion can play tricks on you, like I think you were just alluding to. And the other thing that comes to mind based on what you said so eloquently just now, Jennifer, is that... 
maybe you can do dream modification, not necessarily yeah. give up everything you ever dreamed of. And I need a whole fresh start and I'm just going to dash it all and flush it and go do something completely different, but you can keep doing what you're doing and layer other things on top of it, or maybe throw a few twists into what you're doing to make it new and different just so you have that challenge you really want. And I really acknowledge that. And I think it's great. I want to go ahead and give these guys a link to your book, How to Bounce Back When Your Dreams Have Not Worked Out, Have Burned You Out, or Have Died, uh, which I think we've covered somewhat today. But obviously, when you've written a whole book about it, there's going to be a lot more in there to draw from. So if any of you guys can relate to anything we've talked about today, I would definitely recommend going to www dot mountaintoppodcast.com front slash dreams d-r-e-a-m-s because we've had several jennifers on this show before so that one's taken but mountaintoppodcast.com front slash dreams is where you'll find jennifer doherty's book i highly recommend it you already know she's personable and a lot of fun and funny on top of being fun and uh that's what you guys should do. Go grab a copy of her book. What a great conversation on a topic that very few people dare to even bring up. So I appreciate your courage, your honesty, and the fact that you're simply so personable. Thank you. When talking about such an interesting topic. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you for having me as a guest. This was so fun. Yeah. And guys, if you haven't been to www.mountaintoppodcast.com just yet, I invite you to sign up for 25 minutes with me for free, where we're going to talk about your future. What are your dreams? What do you want to get done in your life, in your career? What kind of adventures would you like to see happen for you? And most importantly of all, what is that relationship with the woman of your dreams going to look like? It is wonderful to dream. I'm not going to talk you out of your dreams. I'm not going to tell you it's not realistic for you to get the kind of woman you want. But you have to know who you want. You have to know what you want to happen in your life. And as your coach, I have seen the light at the end of the tunnel for you ahead of you, and I know you're going to get there. All that's left is for you to schedule 25 minutes with me for free at mountaintoppodcast.com, where you can also sign up for my newsletter, get transcripts of this show and the YouTube version and lots of other free goodies, including pictures of our guests and show notes. It's all there for you at mountaintoppodcast.com. And until I talk to you again real soon, this is Scott McKay from X and Y Communications in San Antonio, Texas. Be good out there. The Mountaintop Podcast is produced by X and Y Communications. All rights reserved worldwide. Be sure to visit www.mountaintoppodcast.com for show notes. And while you're there, sign up for the free X and Y Communications newsletter for men. This is Ed Roy Odom speaking for The Mountaintop Podcast.